Good morning and welcome to this morning's Europe is our future series, the first in a series of three events aimed at a business audience, which will look at the opportunities for Irish companies in the continental European market. We at IIEA have teamed up with Enterprise Ireland to bring you this series of three events exploring the topic over the next few months. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we hope to highlight policy and practical insights for businesses looking to sell more into the continental market or for those who wish to start doing so for the first time. We have got a great lineup of speakers to offer insights here. To open the Thornishta and Minister for Trade, among, among other things, will join us, not virtually, but pre-recordedly, to coin a phrase, to open proceedings. We will then be joined live by the president of Ireland, of one of Ireland's most successful companies over many decades, Neil Nocton of Glen, Glen Dimplex, to share his business experience of cracking the continental European market. We'll then be joined from Brussels by the European Commission's most senior civil servant on the functioning of Europe's single market and industrial policy. Kirsten Jorna is the head of the Directorate General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs at the European Commission. After that, we'll have a panel discussion, which is open to input from you, the audience, to put questions and make comments. The panel will include from Amsterdam, Hildegard McCarvel, who is CEO of Viola Netherlands, and Lanagan, Regional Director for the Eurozone at Enterprise Ireland, and will be rejoined by our keynote speaker, Neil Nocton of Glen Dimplex. So without further ado, um, let me welcome the Taoiseach, uh, after a fashion, who is uh, going to, uh, who gave us some pre-recorded remarks uh, to kick the events off. Colleagues, if you could run that for us, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Theo Bradker here, Tonishta, Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment. It's a pleasure to open today's event. Europe is our future, the untapped potential of the single market for Irish enterprise. It's an opportunity to reiterate the government's message that EU markets can play a pivotal role in Ireland's future. It's almost 50 years since Ireland joined the European Economic Community, and it's nearly 20 years since we adopted the Euro. Our membership has had a significant influence transforming Irish society and our economy for the better. Now we have new challenges and new ambitions. As we navigate through the pandemic and Ireland's new trading relationship with the UK, we are always looking at ways to build resilience in the Irish economy and its enterprise base to sustain jobs and promote exports. Irish owned enterprise is the foundation of our economy and exporting Irish companies are real drivers of growth. Challenges presented by Brexit have underlined the need to accelerate market diversification. While the UK will remain a huge market, higher growth in exports to other markets will reduce Irish-owned companies' dependence on any one market. As part of the government's ambition to grow our domestic SME sector, we're committed to increasing the number of new exporters. The EU and the Eurozone in particular is central to these export ambitions. And there are a number of reasons for this. Number one, the single market. The single market was designed to enable frictionless trade between member states, no customs, tariffs or other trade barriers, with regulatory alignment across the region. With a population of over 440 million people, this is the biggest free trade area in the world, and it's right on our doorstep. Number two, the single currency. Trading in the single currency introduces transparency and removes costs related to foreign exchange and associated risks. These are all good for business and profitability. Our membership of the Eurozone gives access to a single currency area of 340 million people and an economy with combined GDP of 11 trillion euros. Number three, close proximity. Continental Europe is closer than ever. Proximity increases trade opportunities. Partly as a result of Brexit, the increased direct maritime links to France, Netherlands, Belgium, Spain and Portugal have brought us even closer. And fourth, the deepening positive relationship with the EU. Ireland and Irish products have a strong reputation in Europe. We're now a net contributor to the budget, and Irish business people are valued for their flexibility and friendly style, and our products and services are recognised for their innovative edge. While the multinational sector has reaped the benefits of the single market, Irish-owned businesses have yet to take full advantage of what is the biggest free trade area in the world. As you know, Enterprise Ireland is the government's organisation responsible for the development and growth of Irish enterprises in world markets. 
According to EI data for 2019, the value of client exports to the Eurozone as a whole was less than to, than to the UK alone. This is despite the fact that the Eurozone population and Eurozone GDP is five times that of the UK. This is an untapped and immediate opportunity. The Eurozone markets are now central to EI's strategy, and in the two years since the launch of its Eurozone strategy in 2017, exports increased by over 33%. I urge companies to engage with Enterprise Ireland and avail of its supports. These include one-to-one -one advice from a team of market advisors in eight offices across the Eurozone, a world-class market research centre, financial assistance such as the Market Discovery Grant, and GradStart to complement the services provided by market advisors, and also the Enter the Eurozone training programme, a collaboration with ESMT, the top German business school based in Berlin. Before I conclude, I would like to highlight the significance of the Eurozone as a source of imports for Ireland. Although we have a strong focus on exports, the source of imports is also an important consideration for Irish business in terms of efficiency, cost and compliance. Trade is a two-way street and we currently have a significant trade surplus with the European Union. So trucks travelling to continental Europe with Irish products are often returning empty, increasing the cost of transport for exporters. With this in mind, I encourage Irish businesses to examine their supply chains to see where they can benefit from sourcing directly from the single market. I also urge companies to develop their relationship with mainland Europe. Trading with Britain is a natural step for many, considering our shared history, language and geography. But we should not miss out on the bigger markets behind, beyond Britain. We are Irish and we're proud to be European as well. Engagement with our European neighbours brings many rewards cultural, social and economic, and our membership of the EU has had a significant influence in transforming our country for the better. I believe deeper engagement will bring us even more rewards. On that note, I'd like to congratulate the IIEA on your 30th anniversary and commend you for the excellent work you do in providing a forum to exchange and discussion and debate on European affairs. I encourage those who haven't yet become members to do so in order to stay up to date and to contribute to the discussion. We are ambitious for the development of Irish-owned enterprise abroad, and the Eurozone is central to that ambition. We believe that with the relentless focus on innovation and collaboration with other EU member states, the future is bright for Irish companies. I'd like to thank Michael Collins, Director General, Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist, and Anne Lanigan, Eurozone Regional Director in Enterprise Ireland, for organising this forum here today. I'd particularly like to thank all of the speakers who will follow me. These include Kirsten Yorna, Director, Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs in the European Commission. Neil Lockton, Chairman of Glen Dimplex. And Hildegard McCarville, CEO of Veolia Netherlands. So thank you for taking the time to share your experience and expertise with us today. And most of all, thank you to Irish business people in the audience. Your hard work is the foundation of our economy. It's hugely appreciated and it's a privilege to work on your behalf as Minister for Enterprise. So enjoy the rest of the event, and I hope next time we can do it in person. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you uh, to the Thomas. A good opening remark there, highlighting just the scale of the opportunities there. The biggest single market in the world on our doorstep, of which we're part of, for 440 million people. Um, in the EU single market. Brexit has highlighted the importance of frictionless trade and being part of a single market. And also uh, something that perhaps uh, we talk about less and the Thomas to highlight it there, the importance of sourcing from uh, other parts of the single market, uh, an issue that um, means particularly from Eurozone countries that businesses that source from those areas don't have to worry about exchange rate risk, which is uh, another upside of, of sourcing your inputs from, from uh, continental Eurozone countries. Good. So with that, um, having teed up by uh, the Tonishta, we look forward to our keynote speaker, uh, Neil Lockton from Glen Dim Dimplex. Neil, many thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Uh, good morning and thank you, Dan, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak at this event today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the webinar. Um, I would like to use uh, some slides at the start of the presentation. 
to explain a little bit about Glant Implex, the company, and how we've come to where we are today. Also to explain uh, our business and how we, how we tackle um, business development. Uh, I will then uh, get rid of the slides. I think we all have enough PowerPoint in our lives so we can see a few faces. Um, and I could give, share a few thoughts of, of my personal experiences over the years. Um, Glen Gimplex is an Irish uh, headquartered family owned international group, which is a world leader in intelligent electric heating, as well as having a global presence in the consumer appliances, precision cooling and flame technology sectors. Um, in 1973, Glen Electric was established by my father, uh, Martin Nocton, uh, with four colleagues in Uri, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, it was what we would call a startup, but startups weren't invented in the 1970s, with only seven employees uh, manufacturing oil filled radiators. It wasn't a great time to be starting a new business. The troubles in Northern Ireland were just kicking off, and there's a worldwide energy crisis, and people were, were being implored to turn off their heating. In 1976, Harold Wilson, Wilson the British Prime Minister, announced the end of off peak electricity. Although this didn't come to pass, it was enough to send Dimplex spiraling into receivership. Glenn managed to acquire Dimplex, a company eight times its size, it was a leveraged buyer before we even had them, and a brand leader in electric heating. The ambition of the young Glenn Electric was confirmed, and the Glenn Dimplex Group was born. Since the group's foundation in 1973, it has been very entrepreneurial. Continu continuing to grow organically and through acquisitions of much loved brands across the world. In the early 1990s, sorry, in the early 1980s, the group was concerned that its business was heating, therefore too seasonal. And this led to the acquisition of Morphe Richards and other consumer product brands. In early 1990, my dad was approached by Siemens, the German industrial powerhouse. They informed them that the supervisory board had decided that they would either become number two, one or two in the world or exit the category. They had assembled a, a portfolio of brands in a strategic roadmap to achieve market leadership and Dimplex was part of that basket. When my dad refused to sell, they said he must then execute their perfect strategy. Over the following decade, Glenn Dimplex acquired the Siemens owned heating businesses in Germany, Norway, and Canada, and other co companies in uh, the Siemens playbook, Muller in France, Chromalux in Canada, and Novo in Norway. We achieved the German's goal of becoming the biggest player in the global market. Over the years, other acquisitions followed, strengthening our position in consumer products, precision cooling, and flame. Following the Brexit vote, we were concerned at our dependence on the UK and actively acquired companies in the US, uh, Australia and Ireland. We have a wide reach in Europe across all our businesses. We have manufacturing plants. Sorry, I'm missing a slide here someplace. <laughs> Sorry, we have a wide range reach across all parts of our business. We have manufacturing and R&D facilities in Ireland, France, Germany, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK as well as offices and distribution partners or networks in several other EU member states. This slide shows our location of our main operations, but our sales reach extends far beyond this, with customers in over 75 countries around the world. So if I can just go back. Standing on the shoulders of what has gone before, we see we have great opportunities in four key areas. But what holds us together is our purpose, being a leader in the transition to a sustainable world. We believe we have a meaningful role in helping the consumers as they transition to this new world without compromising quality or comfort. A lot of our products are, are about finding solutions for our customers to allow them to, tra to transition to a sustainable world. I'll just spend a few minutes explaining these categories and give you a flavor of the products. 
In the heating and ventilation space, we have a range of low carbon products and solutions, mainly electrical, for predominantly residential and light commercial buildings. We are pride ourselves of being the leading manufacturer and supplier of electric heating solutions in Europe and North America. Our cooling portfolio provides high precision machine and process cooling solutions for medical applications such as MRI and CT scanners and industrial applications including extraction, laser cutting, machine tooling and the food and beverage industry. We use the latest in refrigeration technology to have the lowest carb carbon footprint for these systems. Our cooling systems are used to manufacture the precursors of the MCR COVID-19 tests and to store the vaccines at ultra low temperatures. We also offer a wide range of appliances for the home, including kitchen appliances and audio systems. In today's pandemic parlance, these products have been deemed essential. We make products to prepare and store food and keep you entertained. We have a range of flame technologies, wood, electric, gas fueled for heating and decorative purposes in residential and commercial buildings. We give the consumer choices as they transition away from coal fires and other fossil fuels to more sustainable options without compromising the quality, comfort or ambience of a focal point in their home. I'd now like to talk about how we go about business development in Glen Dimplex. We have recently established a new group business development function to focus on delivering long-term sustainable growth, looking at future opportunities, five, 10 years and beyond. This function is adopting a group-wide approach, looking at all four technology areas, focusing on international market development, key trends and new business concepts, technology, external affairs, emerging and acquisitions. We are aiming to identify opportunities for growth in our home markets and scale in new territories. We have recognized the importance of strategic business development in terms of creating sustainable growth and building a secure future for our group, group, which is why we have deliberately invested in a dedicated team. This is a small but dynamic team with a varied skill set. Most importantly, it has a clear direction, top level support within the group, and strong collaboration channels with our global business units so it can focus on next generation value creation. It is a small team for now, but as it proves its value and delivers impact, we will scale it up accordingly. We are looking at new business opportunities globally. However, as an Irish headquartered business with significant operations and business in the EU already, Europe will be a key target for us for business development. One of the main tools we've developed to aid with international market development is a funnel, which allows us to assess markets in a robust and consistent way. Systemize how we prioritize opportunities and make sure that we are set up for the best chances of success by identifying the most attractive markets and ruling out low potential markets early on in the process. The funnel includes a, a market attractiveness model, which pulls data in from a variety of sources and allows us to assess macro trends and economic strength of a market, as well as Glen Dimplex business suitability. It identifies where we have permission to play and how we can win. Um, as I already mentioned, given our existing footprint in Europe, Europe today, in Ireland, France, Germany, the Nordics, growth in the EU, both our home markets and new markets will be a key priority. This slide shows some of the initial attractiveness score, scoring of countries in Eastern Europe, which we have put through our model, and the results are very promising in terms of highlighting the attractiveness of the EU for doing business. Our, our first port of call will be the, the Baltic States and Poland. In addition, there are several macro trends which are particularly developed in the EU, EU, which are very favorable for our business. For example, the drive for green growth and decarbonization, which is gaining ever more focus from governments, policymakers, businesses, consumers and customers alike. For all of us here today, the past year has been like none we have ever experienced before. As businesses and individuals, we have had to respond to unprecedented challenges and are continuing to have to do so. Brexit, COVID-19, global supply chain problems, commodity shortages, 
and many other challenges have forced businesses to act differently, be agile and think more creatively. Several pressing issues have been brought to the fore and none more so than the climate crisis and the need to take substantial and meaningful action now. Throughout the EU, COVID recovery plans are intrinsically linked with green growth and the just transition to a more sustainable world. This comes on top of the work that was already in motion through the Green Deal and realizing Europe's ambition to become the first climate neutral continent. This plays right into a sweet spot for Glen Dimplex. As a leading manufacturer of low carbon heating appliances, we have solutions to solve the challenges of decarbonizing buildings and we are well equipped to help our customers and partners transition to a more sustainable world. We need to seize this opportunity to affect last, lasting change. As part of this, we will need to look beyond our current ways of doing business and explore new markets, new partnerships, business concepts and solutions. Europe provides very accessible opportunities for us and many other Irish businesses right at our doorstep. However, some caution is necessary. Even though the EU single market is a common market, from country to country, the market requirements are different. And it certainly isn't the case that Irish products and solutions can simply be lifted and sold directly in other parts of the EU. For example, on screen, you can see two two kilowatt fan heaters, one of our simplest products. Both are exactly the same in terms of functionality and specification, but different in design due to different market preferences. Some customization or localization is needed and a strong understanding of the target market is needed by all Irish businesses looking, for, looking to export or expand abroad. I will now get rid of the PowerPoint um, and give you some of my own uh, personal experience. And if I can look uh, to Asia, where they put a particular emphasis on developing the personal re relationship before business even starts. They do this so that when something does go wrong, an international trade, something always will go wrong. There is a personal relationship to fall back on and get the issues resolved amicably. Developing personal skills and network, developing personal relationships and networking are skills that can be learned and should be considered. Making conversation about topics other than business is an excellent way of breaking down personal barriers. And we are fortunate that we are actually more familiar with our European cousins than we think. I first met Anne, Anne Lanigan uh, when she was the Enterprise Ireland Director in Japan. I was trying to make conversation with potential partners, but what did I know about sumo wrestling or Japanese baseball? Through the 6-1 news, we know that Mario Draghi is the Prime Minister of Italy and Angela Merkel is the Chancellor of Germany. We know about La Liga in Italy, the contest between Barcelona and Real Madrid, and the many European golfers on the PGA Tours. Most of us know that Toulouse beat La Rochelle last Saturday and Manchester United went down to Villarreal in Warsaw just last Wednesday. That gives us plenty of fodder for conversation over a beer, coffee or a glass of vino. The Irish also benefit from having an excellent reputation in Europe as an open and friendly nation with whom it is easy to build trusted relationships. This gives us a distinct advantage when looking at new business opportunities in Europe. When you can safely, get out there, get immersed in the markets, get to know your partners, dig deep. I tell my business development team that I will not be happy on a research trip if I don't have a waste of time meeting. I will not know we have dug deep enough if I don't have a wasteful meeting. Formalize your business development function. We are fortunate in Glen Dimplex with our scale, we can have a small team. But every business should identify who is responsible for this role in your organization and make sure they can carve out some time in their week to dedicate to this job. Make sure they identify the highest potential opportunities and focus on these markets and sectors. Irish businesses also have access to the unrivaled expertise of Enterprise Ireland. Over the years, I and Glen Dimplex has greatly benefit for, benefited from the support of Enterprise Ireland, both of, in, in terms of tapping into the wealth of knowledge and expertise they have, as well as availing of funding opportunities for market research activities. Enterprise Ireland are absolute professionals in their field and real ambassadors for Irish business. 
who are here to provide tactical and strategic advice in many markets around the world and at all stages of potential new market development. I can't recommend them highly enough, and I'm extremely grateful for the support we have received over the years. In Enterprise Ireland, each and every, every person uh, wants us to, to succeed. And I believe this is because they are true patriots. If I could just finish with one final message. Um, in 1919, the first doll made the mansion house his home. Two years later, in 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was ratified in the same location. At the very first meeting of our new parliament, the very first message to the free nations of the world said this, Ireland is the gateway to the Atlantic. Ireland, the last post outpost of Europe to the West, the point upon which the great trade routes between East and West converge. Why, a hundred years later, have we forgotten the message and the legacy that the matriarchs and patriarchs of our nation left us? Because as a small island nation, not only do we value international relationships, we depend upon them. Multinationals have taken heed and have established in Ireland as a bulkhead, not just for Ireland and the UK, but to maximize their opportunities in all of Europe, and for many of them, the entire EMEA region. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to listening to the Director General and engaging in the discussion with Anne Hildegard and Dan later in this webinar. Many thanks uh, for that, Neil. Just before handing over to Kirsten, could, could I just a quick follow up? Your, your prioritization of Poland and the Baltics. Any. Right, Dan, I've lost you. I think you're back. Uh, did, I, did I freeze there? Yes, you did. Sorry, you just you, you got as far as Poland, as politics of Poland. Oh, yeah, I was just interested to do it, Neil, as to what, what, on what basis you, you folks are prioritizing that sort of northeast market in Europe, the Baltics and Poland. Well, we've identified it through, through, uh, through the, the, our, 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 our model um, that they have high potential. And that comes from a, a, a variety of factors. Um, we are presently looking for partners. We're looking for potential acquisitions, um, and uh, we believe that it is it is a country. They are their country and regions with the right right dynamics, um, and that as part of the EU, very accessible to us. Um, you know, although we may speak different languages, we have the same vocabulary when we're talking about about business and priorities uh, and our and our 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 our, our, our key. Um, uh, uh, deliverables. Great. Look, we look forward to digging deeper into those things during the, the Q and A session and having uh, having questions and comments from the audience as well. Um, Kirsten Yorna, good morning, uh, and thank you for joining us from Brussels. Uh, Kirsten has a wide uh, range of experience in the European Commission uh, in a number of roles uh, and is currently now the Director General at the Directorate General. Uh, dealing with the internal market, industrial policy, something that is becoming increasingly relevant in a world where um, industrial policy is back in fashion. It was out of fashion for a long time, now back in fashion. So uh, particularly good to have Kirsten and her insights uh, to hear uh, what the Commission is thinking about for the internal market as we hopefully exit the uh, pandemic. Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to thank the Institute and the European uh, uh, and the Enterprise Ireland actually for inviting me. I know that this is a very special year for the Institute because you will be 30, and uh, my sincere congratulations. We very much appreciate how you've managed over all these years to put Europe single market in the middle of the debate, also in Ireland. Um, I would also like to, uh, to underline the impressive achievements of Enterprise Europe, um, who has been successfully coordinating the work among uh, Irish SMEs and connecting them to the broader SME community uh, in the single market. I just want to quote one number from a recent survey, 100% 100% satisfaction of, uh, uh, of the SMEs partnering uh, with you, uh, satisfaction about the advisory services. I think that's a very remarkable achievement. 
Thank you for that as well. SMEs are the backbone of our single market economy. And um, as uh, we're now in the 15th month of the econ of the pandemic, there is no doubt that that has been a hit uh, and SMEs have suffered quite a lot. Our recent surveys say that the number of SMEs has fallen by 1.3% in 2020 and employment is estimated to have fallen by 1.7%, which means 1.4 million jobs lost in SMEs. Um, we must now ensure and help and support SMEs to embark on the road to recovery and as swiftly as possible, and also to be able to face the challenges of the green and digital transition. Last year, the Commission adopted its SME strategy and we already launched ambitious measures to help SMEs reap the benefit of the twin transition. Um, just as an example, I'm thinking of the digital innovation hubs uh, that support the digitalization of SMEs, where you have a testing ground as well, or our network of sustainability uh, advisors that are provided through the Enterprise Europe network. Um, I'd like to say a word now on the update of our industrial strategy, which, uh, which we presented uh, a couple of weeks ago. Because in this strategy, we even go further. Um, in fact, we adopted this strategy because we needed to, to draw some lessons from the pandemic. Um, and um, I would like to zoom in on three lessons. The first is that the single market, we must reinforce it to be the ultimate engine of our long-term recovery. Uh, it's the fabric of Europe's strength and the previous uh, speaker, Neil, uh, I only heard you intervene at the end, but uh, you very much highlighted that as well. It makes you speak a common language when you talk about uh, the economy and your projects. Um, but what we saw in the crisis is that uh, under seven, it can come under sudden and heavy disruptions and the seam could be undone very quickly. In the early days, we witnessed uh, uh, border closures, supply disruptions, lack of predictability, fragmentation, and a bit of it is still around today when we look at you know, free movement of, uh, of, of workers and different testing requirements. We're there too. We're in the process of repairing it, but still, we, we can still see that. We need to uphold the free movement of goods and services of workers, and we need to prepare the single market for a possible next crisis. This is why the Commission announces now to propose a single market emergency instrument, which would lay down the protocols for how to act together to make sure that not only free movement is uh, sustained, but also that we can maybe um, how we address shortages in certain products um, should that arise again. Um, we will also mobilize important investment to support SMEs. Um, we also in, uh, announced to enhance our work on the alternative resolution schemes, and we want to address payment delays uh, in, and also measures to deal with solvency risks because we see a solvency specter uh, coming up uh, now in the, in the coming months. The second main lesson from the pandemic is that we need to tackle Europe's strategic dependencies. Um, the crisis has over revealed our over-dependency on third countries for supply of critical goods and, uh, our lim and that limits our responsibility to reply to the shocks. Remember the masks, remember the, the, the ventilators. Um, a lot of SMEs did a great job in just shifting their production quickly to produce protective equipment, coats, masks, um, uh, shoes, uh, or sanitizers. And I, I really want to thank everybody in the room who contributed to that as well. Uh, but we, have, we can do better. Uh, we also, we, what we will do is to analyze and address possible current and possible future strategic dependencies, both on technological, the microprocessor story, for example, and industrial scale. But we want, of course, also to safeguard the open and trade-based EU economy, uh, economy. Strategic dependencies can have a particular 
heavy impact on SMEs. This is why both the Europe Network, Europe Ent Enterprise Europe Network, and the European Cluster Cooperation, which includes 10 uh, Irish clusters, um, can play a crucial role. They can assist SMEs to address, address disruptions and vulnerabilities and increase their resilience by diversifying suppliers, connecting to new local and cross-border partners. The European cluster network, uh, 1,000 clusters in total, was very, very active in the, uh, in the pandemic, in particular in the beginning. They, the clusters met every morning at a, at a jour fixed time and, uh, and looked at what was happening and how to act. And they were, very, they were the most agile actors, actually, in uh, tackling uh, the, the early uh, issues in the pandemic. The third main lesson from the pandemic is that we need to accelerate the green and digital transition. 2020 showed that the business case and the consumer awareness for green and digital transition is stronger than ever. In partnership with industry, public authorities, social partners and other stakeholders, we want to co-create uh, transition pathways for the industrial ecosystems. We have 14 industrial ecosystems in the single market and which range from energy intensive to tourism to retail. And uh, we want to make sure that all partners are aligned and that all tools and means from different level, European, national, regional, are brought together uh, to, uh, to go through that transition together. Uh, we are currently working uh, nonstop on the tourism uh, pathway, transformation pathway, because that's the ecosystem that has been had, hit really bad. Um, and they need, they're almost in a kind of reset button uh, situation. So we focus a lot of effort there at the moment and, and, and also ministers, everybody is engaged. Uh, other relevant ecosystems uh, also very hit was textile. Um, but then there's also energy intensive industries uh, where it's a, it's a question of survival to be able to do this green transition. So this is where we are, will be reaching out. Um, uh, the business case for green and digital transition is also very relevant for Ireland. Um, further effort to decarbonize the country and the, uh, the, the, uh, the production will make a significant different difference. Uh, in particular, when it comes to retrofitting buildings, transportation sector, and incentives to promote the low carbon economy. On the digital side of things, obviously, Ireland has a very strong leadership when it comes to the integration of digital technology in SMEs, e-commerce, public services, uh, uh, and digital public services for businesses. Still, I think there are opportunities uh, for improving digital skills, which remain below EU average, and for e-business processes such as supply chain management, enterprise resource planning, customer relations management, all of this would help to enhance SME productivity. What we see in Ireland is actually a kind of two-speed digital economy. You have the very big companies, very sophisticated, and then you have the smaller uh, SMEs where the rate of adoption and adoption of digital uh, tools is still lagging a bit. But it's not only about the how, it's also uh, about the what, it's also about the how. And what we are looking for, and I already mentioned it when I talked about the transition pathways, is a collaborative approach. Um, and um, so whilst we want to address these three burning issues, resilience of the single market, uh, strategic dependencies, and accelerating the green and digital transition, we also want to look at how we do it. We want to use a more cooperative approach. And we think that that's the only one that will be that will deliver. Um, this is why we will continue to support new industrial uh, alliances and strategic areas. And these alliances then bring together uh, all the players, they pool resources to have scale and impact. Uh, if I look at hydrogen as an example, so it was the hand and the egg question. If I invest in electrolyzers, hmm, should I do it? Because I'm not sure I will have a customer who uses it. If I'm a steel company, should I invest in hydrogen-based process to green my steel? If I'm not sure that I will have enough hydrogen coming in. So what the alliances do, they bring it all together. And on hydrogen, it's the 
you know, electrolyzers, will I have enough renewables? So we have the renewable uh, energy producers, we have the electrolyzers. Then there's the question, uh, the hydrogen, it's, it's produced, but it's not close to the factory gate. So how do I get it to the factory gate? That's uh, the storage and the transport. And then the question is, then is the industrial use, the appliance uh, and, uh, and who take it. Um, that's, for example, the green steel or the cement industry. But that, even that is not enough because then you have to think these new green products, there's new green steel, who will use it? Where's the demand side for these products? So that's where big steel users like the car industry come in. And that's the beauty of the alliances. It brings everybody together and they all start at the same time. So we build the supply chain at the same time. It worked for batteries. I'm sure it will work for hydrogen and it may work for others like the uh, microprocessors, as I already mentioned. Um, the, uh, of course, uh, and there are some uh, Irish participants in these alliances, but there's scope for improving Irish participation, uh, for example, at all levels of the battery value chain. Inno Energy manages the industrial aspects of this alliance on behalf of the Commission and is ready to help here and give advice. We also support member states' efforts to pool resources via what we call important projects of common interest, IPSES. And they function in areas where the market alone cannot deliver the breakthrough innovation. And there's also the possibility to blend it on top of it with support from the uh, EU budget. On hydrogen, we expect, you know, three, four, five, maybe more, Ipsos, uh, and you see it in all the recovery plans of the member states, that they are reserving money uh, for this purpose. Uh, we're also reviewing the state aid rules for Ipsos, uh, and including with a uh, wish to enhance the participation of SMEs in and facilitate this in such, uh, in such projects. Um, I believe these projects present a great business opportunity for SMEs, and I would also uh, encourage Ireland to explore participation. Um, there are telling examples where Ireland is involved in IPSES, for example, uh, the Celtic Interconnector, which enables Ireland and France to exchange electricity, providing Ireland's only direct energy connection to continental Europe. I also have in mind the Northern Lights Project, that's a CO2 transport project, which involves Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Sweden. So in conclusion, what we want is a more SME-friendly Europe, uh, because it's with the SMEs that we will be able to make these really big transformations. Um, I'd like to underline that in these times of hardship, uh, the pandemic has also created momentum for our single market economy and for SMEs in that economy. We will, as the Commission, continue to support the involvement of SMEs in all industrial ecosystems, supply chains and collaborative projects. We will also continue to support a prompt payment culture and an SME-friendly regulatory environment. Uh, the newly proposed one-in-one-out approach is in the way we regulate at EU level will help us to further minimize burdens when legislation is proposed and take better impact, uh, better uh, assess in a better way and take account of the cumulative impact of legislation. And that's very relevant when we move forward on the climate package. On the 14th of July, the Commission will propose a package of uh, little dozen of uh, texts to uh, to create the regulatory framework for the minus 55 um, ambition in 2030. Uh, and, and we will look very carefully at the overall coherence of this. Um, and I have a big team uh, in DG Grow also engaged on this. Um, Ireland has shown uh, that it has the capacity and the agility to take up these unprecedented challenges and to ensure that SMEs in Ireland are future-proof. We want to help. Uh, I hope that your projects catch the blue wind, the blue single market economy wind of Europe. And I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, for joining us. I wonder if I could uh, just follow up with one question. You mentioned the regulatory burden. 
and the importance for the commission of the one in one out uh, tactic to ensure that the cumulative effect of regulation is not too burdensome for businesses. For the companies that are joining us today, uh, thinking of uh, penetrating the European market, despite being a single market, different countries do uh, have different levels of regulation. Um, do you see from a commission perspective, some countries being much more heavily regulated than others in general? I suppose the Southern European countries tend to have higher levels of regulation than Northern European countries. Is that a factor in terms of integrating the European market? Uh, I don't think you can generalize in the way uh, you do it. Uh, there is, I would say there are certain sectors where member states, whether from North or South, East or West, feel that they need more control than others, health, for example, but also persons. So what we uh, created is the Single Market Enforcement Task Force. And the Single Market Enforcement Task Force is, uh, is the commission with all the member states. And we're looking at the pain points um, where you have regulation, which you know even may be compatible with EU rules, but still is a pain point. And uh, we've engaged work, for example, on uh, uh, the uh, recognition of professional qualifications, uh, where we see that uh, member states have very heavy ex ante rules, um, and they're not the same anywhere. So uh, before people can exercise their, their jobs. And we um, and we're now we listed them. We came to several hundred of them, and we're going through one by one. And uh, member states have uh, pledged to reduce them and to uh, because they serve no purpose. They uh, and and digitization will play a big role on this. So that's one plank. Um, we also look at business services because business services uh, take architects now. What we know is that our buildings are uh, responsible for 40% of our CO2 emissions. That's why we have the renovation wave, to renovate our buildings and to make sure that they're more energy efficient. How to do this? I mean, it's technology that will help. Now, if you need, you need architects who know and engineers who know how to deal with that and spread the information. However, if you look across Europe, you know, if an architect, if an Irish architect wants to work in another country, yes, or she has to take uh, a new insurance. That's stupid. You know, if you have an insurance for professional firms. So we're looking at these things. And here in the update of the industry strategy, we propose to work through standards, not regulation, standards, uh, and to develop standards for, uh, for this type of service. And then we could go back to member states and say, you know, if that architect follows the standard, the European agreed standard, then there is no need to ask all kinds of information, all kind of other, you know, insurance and other things. So that's how we try in a pragmatic way um, to, to make it easier. But rather than come from uh, the regulatory and the compliance angle, we come from what is really hampering business angle and to have a conversation about that. Because we need our companies to invest. And if it's too difficult, the, the business case, then investors will not come in. So we have an interest in removing these things. Thank you. I know you need to leave us in about two minutes, but one final question, if I may. The uh, rules around government subsidizing businesses, the state aid rules, were suspended during the pandemic, given the scale of the, the shock for, for businesses and the economy. There is some concern that different countries have more capacity to help their businesses, and this is causing a, an unevenness, a, a not a level playing field in the single market. Do you see a pathway back to uh, a leveling that playing field? Uh, back to the state aid rules being applied? I mean, uh, we didn't suspend all state aid rules. We uh, had the temporary state aid framework, which was now prolonged, which helps to keep liquidity in the companies because that's we wanted companies to survive because that means they can pay their workers and their employees who are highly skilled. Uh, it's, it's very sad that we lost, uh, as I said before, uh, at least 1.4 1, 1. million jobs in the SMEs. But 
it's still important. Uh, it was important to stabilize that because that's the only way you can reinvest to reignite after this pandemic. Um, and uh, it was not only the member states that we said, you know, here's the temporary framework um, and, and go for it. What we also did is uh, to uh, support with SURE, the new instrument, the, uh, the unemployment, short-term unemployment schemes. You know, when the pandemic started, there were, I think, only 12 member states who had a short-term unemployment schemes. And now there are, in all member states, short-term unemployment schemes, which we back up uh, for the member states with the SURE. And I think there are now 19 member states who have been supported their unemployment schemes. Uh, via SURE to retain the staff and the, the incredible workforce that we have in Europe. So there was a reason to do this. Is this now unleveling the playing field? I, I think it, it maintained it maintained the status quo. And uh, we are now reviewing our state aid rules at the moment um, in order to have a good level playing field for, uh, for this. So I... Uh, I see that the challenge that you mentioned, but I also see that we are very actively addressing it. And as I said, these uh, IPSAs on uh, cross-border projects that we see and the hydrogen, the batteries, it, it means that the collective effort benefits collectively as well. So that's another way of creating a level playing field where everybody can, uh, can participate. And these, these big supply chains future Supply chains of the future, batteries and, and hydrogen, and microprocessors probably uh, as well, cloud coming up. Uh, they are they are creating a level playing field in themselves. Because Kristen, of my thank, you, thank you for joining us this morning from Brussels to to give us that those perspectives from from the European Commission. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Bye. Good. So let's turn to our panel discussion. Um, this is a Q&A um, session. Uh, you can contribute. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A function. You can put in a comment or a question there. Uh, you can identify yourself. That would be helpful. You can aim the question at any of our three speakers on the panel or none, if that's your preference. So let me introduce the panel. Neil, you already know. Uh, joining us from the Netherlands is Hildegard McCarvel. Hildegard is the CEO of Viola ne uh, Netherlands, and she's also the non-executive director of, the, uh, of that business's uh, Irish operation. As well as that, she is the vice president of the Ireland Netherlands Business Association. Uh, so extensive experience in uh, in that market uh, over the Netherlands. Uh, and also Anne Lanigan joins us. Uh, Anne runs the Enterprise Ireland's uh, operation in the Eurozone. Uh, she, before joining Enterprise Ireland, she has almost two decades experience in the private sector and within Enterprise Ireland, uh, as uh, Neil mentioned, uh, has uh, experience in Japan, a uh, particularly difficult market to crack for anyone who, who knows about doing business in, in Japan. And she was also head of the Brexit unit, which uh, I suppose gave, uh, gave her a very deep insight into the nature of uh, barriers to trade between uh, markets and frictions in, in different markets and how important they can be for business. Good, okay. So let's um, go to the Netherlands, start with, uh, with you, Hildegard, and, and some thoughts on, on your experience uh, coming from Ireland and running a business in another member state. Um, thoughts, experiences, takeaways uh, that you think might be of relevance to our audience. Yep. Uh, thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, yes, I, I think I'm slightly in the unique position, given that I have been a client of Enterprise Ireland when I was working for an Irish organisation. Uh, I have been the person arriving in Schiphol with the task of growing a business, not having a clue of the country, the market, the language or, or their culture. Um, and at the other end, I am now the person that probably Irish companies are approaching uh, maybe with their service offerings. So I'll try and share what uh, knowledge and experience I have with you and hopefully it's insightful. The first thing I would say as a, a person practically and the Dutch are practical, so I'll start that way. Um, when I first landed in the, the Netherlands, uh, the first thing that I did was actually create a, a network. So again, the um, organizations that were in Ireland, what were the Dutch branch of that? 
that gives you a base of uh, um, professional uh, comp companies, peers, somebody to actually talk to and to understand um, uh, everything that is uh, not seen. So 4% of the world doesn't matter and everything else is emotions, feelings, culture. Uh, what does that actually mean? You gain a huge insight into that. Um, and I think um, Enterprise Ireland um, are uh, one of our, our key partners also in the Ireland Netherlands Business Association. And I find that really um, useful. So business chambers uh, really uh, appropriate that way or institute of directors or, or um, peer groups like that. The second thing I would say then is really also to use, um, I think it's been mentioned quite a few times today, uh, digital. I mean, COVID has really advanced that uh, from a perspective. So we all have Google Translate, LinkedIn translates into the language that you normally write in. And if you use the sales navigator tools there, you will find a huge amount uh, about the markets, who you can connect with and what you can do. So there's a lot of practical research that can be done. The third thing I would say, and building upon what Neil had, had presented, was that market research, you know. Um, Neil, you, you talked about uh, sports, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a Roy Keane, you know. Uh, plan to fail, you know, or, uh, uh, fail, or fail to plan, plan to fail. So I think um, really understand what market are you going for? Europe is a huge market. Each country is different. What is the product offering that you're giving? What are the unique situations of that country? So legislation, the broad legislation is the same. We know we have the Green Deal in Europe. We know we're going to carbon neutrality and, and to sustainability, but each country will vary. So I will take my own business. Uh, we're an environmental services company. Um, in the Netherlands, 20% uh, or a quarter of the, the land is actually below sea level. That means that water supply and drinking water and wastewater is regulated by a specific body of the, the Dutch government. That's very different in France and in Belgium where we can provide those uh, services as a, as a private company. So understand the nuances, the differences, understand uh, how the market works. What are the local nuances? If you're in the, the food market, knowing that, you know, um, uh, tastes vary, more sugar maybe in, in Southern Europe versus uh, uh, Northern Europe. In relation to the distribution channels, is it done by partners, um, uh, who to partner with? And then I think that goes back to finding maybe through Enterprise Ireland, or as I did, maybe just a local advisor to give me a background to understand what is the market, what is the regulation, who are the players? Because obviously you're going to walk in with your value proposition, but there are competitors in the market already. So knowing them, knowing their position, um, knowing, um, as, as Neil had said, Siemens gave a huge opportunity for his own organization, knowing what their position is and being able to step in and step out can be a, a platform for you to grow and grow rapidly in relation to where it is. So that's the, the first thing. Um, then in relation to, um, I would say, uh, the Netherlands per se itself, I think it's a really great market to do our first trial in. Um, everyone speaks English. The Dutch are very practical. It's they are used to being um, a small, um, I suppose, a small landmass and having to adapt in order to to uh, grow. But they are, you know, the seventeenth richest economy in the world. They are the second largest exporter of agriculture in the world after the U.S. Despite their, you know, their, their size. So they're a brilliant um, trade. Um, trading partner and also if it works there it'll work anywhere else you know and um, in terms of style and approach they're very direct uh, my personal experience my first few sales meetings were very short and swift uh, I hadn't done my homework well enough I learned a lot in relation to it and um, they want references uh, expertise proof that you can do what you do and and knowing that can make a valuable um can, can lead to much greater sales and, and, and much quicker turnaround in relation to, to where it is. I would also say that based on what Kirsten said, um, as Irish people, we're quite um, unique or we have a lot of competencies in being able to collaborate and cooperate. It comes naturally to us. And the same also in the Dutch context. So that is our super strength. I think we should uh, use it and be able to, to take advantage from that. Um, going to the point on value proposition, be very clear what it is. Um, what can you offer compared to your competitors? Is it um, 
uh, uh, product differentiation? Is it a cost optimization? Is it uh, being able to address a need in the market? For example, in the Netherlands, there's a shortage of technical skills. Can you fill that void that people can't? It's also an aging workforce, which means people will outsource more in relation to where it is. Um, can you help with changing legislation? Um, the offering uh, from Neil, um, it rang true to me a lot, Neil, it's a bit like our own business. So that whole thing of being able to address the decarbonization or the need to reduce um, energy consumption. What is that? How do you have it? And, and being very clear uh, what unique position is to the market. And then finally, when you approach the client or their target client, know your client. So um, again, I go back to LinkedIn. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been approached by companies um, wanting to pitch me a clean tech solution or a service offering, um, uh, for example, in relation to maybe um, sensors, smart sensors for, for waste bins. Um, Veolia in the Netherlands is not in that market. If they had just looked at our website or looked at my LinkedIn profile, they would have known it. And that goes, you know, the first contact is, is key. The first impression is key. Um, lazy, shoddy work is, not, is you know, it's, it's not useful to anyone. So I would say just do your homework, be practical, um, trial and error for sure. Um, but I, I really leverage the networks, leverage Enterprise Ireland, leverage the equivalent of Ireland Netherlands Business Association, the country you're going for, and do your homework. Good. Thank you, Hildegard, very much to, to the point. Just a follow-up question, if I may, in, in terms of uh, an Irish company maybe looking at accessing, getting into the, the Dutch market for the first time, um, would you recommend people considering a partner, a local partner, or do you think that the frictions in the market are such that companies can just access the market directly, see, seek uh, distributors, etc. cetera, there? Um, where, where would you there, there is no right or wrong answer, even if I take my my um, own business in, in relation to, to it um, within um, the district heating market that we operate in. We, we teamed up with a, with a Dutch pension fund to be able to capture some of the market for one of the acquisitions we were doing. We brought the technical expertise, they brought the local culture and flavor in relation to it. And we did that because we knew, you know, that would be successful to acquire it. In others, we can go directly to the market ourselves and be able to do it. And for others, we will team up with advisors or um, um, consultants maybe to understand better uh, the needs, especially when it comes to public tenders, that's the needs of the market. So there's no right or wrong. It, it again, it goes back to what's the product offering or the service offering, who's the end client, and, and how is the market structured at, at that stage? So even in our own business, we would take three different approaches. Okay, great. Good. I see the questions are coming in or not coming in a bit slow. Um, people may not have had that extra cup of coffee to get going, uh, but please do, if you have questions uh, to any of the panelists or more general questions, please do put them. Uh, no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, so any thought you might have, and I might come to you for sort of an overview uh, of different markets, but let me let me just share a, an anecdote, uh, Hildegard, about, about the Netherlands. I many years ago chaired uh, an event with uh, politicians and business people, a private event, in, in The Hague, and uh, during the course of the event, they all started shouting at each other. And I thought, I've, I've lost control of this. This is this is a disaster. At the end of the meeting, they... I said, what just happened here? And it was, they just, this is normal way the Dutch uh, have about discussing things. They're extremely forceful, direct, and blunt with each other in a way that we would consider to be bad-mannered. Uh, but for them, not at all. It's just, just the way of doing things. So I suppose um, it being attuned to those sort of cultural sensitivities in different countries is, uh, is always important for doing business, uh, as well as any sort of uh, interaction that one has. Uh, but I just thought I'd share that one. Um, Anne, going, taking a helicopter view as you do, looking across the Eurozone, um, any of the points that have been raised uh, so far in particular, and is there difficult question is is there one or a number of countries that might be easier for irish companies to start with if they're moving into continental europe thanks dan and good morning to everybody thank you for joining us and um, i'll start with your second question um, we do i guess see the benelux as a gateway to europe um, and you know hildegard kind of outlined it there particularly the netherlands um, because 
they are traders. They've been trading for the last 400 years. So um, they really understand trade and they understand business. And I think that directness actually is very useful because it's difficult sometimes to get a meeting in the Netherlands, but when you get it, you know they're interested. Um, so I would say it is a good starting point and it's our biggest market for our client companies in the Eurozone at the moment. Um, unbelievably really, because it isn't the biggest population or the biggest GDP. Um, but I wouldn't, um, I guess, forget about the other markets either. And we have eight offices across six countries in the Eurozone. So we have in the Netherlands, we have in, in um, Belgium, we have uh, two offices in France, two in Germany, and then we have an office in Madrid and Spain and Milan and Italy. And those are the six countries that really um, we see as most opportunity for our client companies at the moment. You know, there are 19 countries in the Eurozone, but they're the six that really um, demonstrate the most opportunity in terms of our, our exports at the moment. Um, just, you know, you ask about um, what are the things that maybe have resonated so far, things people have said. I, I think for me, um, just focusing in on the challenges, I would see that there are, are three key challenges for Irish companies in entering and scaling in the Eurozone. And the first one is really actually about that ambition, the awareness, the familiarity, and the recognition that actually there really is huge opportunity here. And, and a number of people have referred to it and referred to the fact that our multinationals have taken such advantage of access to the single market, whereas Irish enterprise, Irish owned enterprise, probably still hasn't done that. And we are seeing great growth in our exports. We, we need to do an awful lot more. Um, you know, our exports, and when I say our, I mean our client exports into the Eurozone, um, are two thirds of our client exports into the UK, despite the fact that the Eurozone is five times the size. And I think that Tisha or uh, Connish mentioned that earlier. Um, so we're really only scratching the surface. And that opportunity, I, I hate to see lost opportunity and it's sitting there. And the event today and, and, and the series that we're running is, you know, um, an attempt to try and address that. Um, I hope we will encourage more companies to look at it. The second thing is sales and marketing. And, um, you know, both Neil and Hildegard um, really looked at this. And I suppose as Irish people, I think sometimes we see sales and marketing as this black art. Um, it's not a black art. It's, it's, it's actually quite, it's, you know, it's a process really. You know, Neil talked about the funnel and, and the kind of marketing process where you start with the big funnel and narrow down into, OK, so where do you want to focus in? You know, you need to qualify strong leads. There needs to be a sales approach. And actually, I'm an engineer by background, and I find that the sales process is actually an engineering process. It's not an art at all. Um, and so I, I guess we really need to focus in on, on those skills. And of course, Enterprise Ireland is a number of supports to help with that. But, but really, as a company, I think that you know, you need to, to bring in the skills if you don't have sales and marketing skills. They're very, very important skills in the same way as you need to have a CFO, you should have a sales director. Um, and if you're a small company, it's somebody, as Neil pointed out, that maybe he's given, you know, that role as part of the role, but very important to see the importance of that. And then the third thing is language. And certainly in the Eurozone, language is very important. If you, if you want to sell, you should be able to speak the language of your customer. If you don't, you're on the back foot from the beginning. And there are ways to deal with that. You could, if you're recruiting in a sales and marketing person, bring one in who has language. Um, you know, we have actually a grad start program, which allows you to, to recruit um, a graduate. It doesn't have to be a fresh graduate. that can be out of college for a while um, with the language. And if they have a language relevant to your business, then we support it by up to 50% of their salary uh, for each of two years. So, you know, there are ways of dealing with that. They would be the three challenges I would see. Great, thanks, Adam. Let's come back to those. And Neil, I'd be very interested to get you some thoughts on, on, on the different markets. But let's go to some of the questions that we've had uh, from the audience so far. Two on Germany, with one very specific, which may need a little bit, bit of follow-up. Um, um, Robert Rollett asks, do any of the panelists have a suggestion for an Irish SME considering entering the German market? So far, so good. But here's the specialized part. Um, they are involved in specializing engineering solutions for road maintenance. Now, I'm not sure any of the panels are qualified to answer that, but that is a one question from Robert Rollett. Um, so, Anne, you may, good, I'll jump to you on that. Ralph Lissick, who, is, who runs the uh, German Irish Chamber of Commerce, says we see more and more Irish companies asking for support for their supply chain. Uh, is there any specific funding for this? So, 
you know, supply chains, despite the huge disruption of COVID, have held up in most cases remarkably well. Um, international trade is, has rebounded uh, rapidly, but there, there are issues in some supply chains. And so Ralph is, is interested to know, is, are there any um, specific support measures uh, around supply chain issues? And again, Anne, I think that's probably uh, directed at you, but if any of the other panelists have any thoughts on either of those, but Anne, back to you for both of those. Yeah, so, so I guess um, starting with the question around the German market and um, we have an office in, in Dusseldorf, a large office in Dusseldorf, and we also have an office in Munich. So um, if you are an Enterprise Ireland client, then our market advisors there can certainly help you with that. But depending on how advanced you are as an exporter, you might like to have a look at, to, to go to our market research centre, which is you know, a state of the art market research centre, which we have now, because of, of uh, restrictions, we have provided uh, virtual access um, to all of our um, uh, databases in there and reports in there and that might be a starting point but certainly we're already working with companies in that space and our market advisors across the eurozone are um, experienced in working with clients in particular niches and I would have to say that most of our clients are in the niche Ireland you know SME, Irish SMEs offer niche offerings rather than mass offerings and so that's something that we are you know very experienced in and very happy to have a conversation about that um, but but you know I'm sure there are opportunities and um, the second question about the supply chain and I'm not I'm not quite sure I understand the question is it support for companies who are finding it difficult to bring product in on their supply chain and, and, and if that's the question we are certainly encouraging our clients to to look at their supply chains and to actually have a supplier management process so you know, it's not good enough to have one supplier for a critical part, for example. There are bottleneck parts, and we do have a competitiveness um, section in Enterprise Ireland that can provide support in looking at that and looking at your supply chain. Um, and, and, but of course, you would need to be an Enterprise Ireland client for that. Okay, and Ralph, if you're out there, you want to follow up on that, just put another question through. Uh, Neil, I, I was fascinated by the uh, geographical difference in preference for uh, heating fans. Some yes. prefer the other box, others prefer, you know, is there any particular uh, reason for that? And then a, a question which I, you might have a, a view on from Patrick uh, Tarenkins. Um, can we expect a, sh a shift in sourcing closer to home now that the COVID pandemic and other recent events have shown the vulnerability of global supply chains? Now that's an issue that's come up a lot. Uh, people at the Institute have been raising that, uh, particularly in terms of you know, the very long distance supply chains to Asia. How has Glenn Dimplex considered you know, this issue of long distance supply chains from a sustainability perspective on transport, uh, reliability of those supply chains, chip issues with, with Taiwan? Uh, thoughts on, on vulnerability of your supply chains and what, how you've been thinking about that? Well, I, I, I think uh, you know, the, 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 the year we've lived through has raised uh, a, a lot of issues. Um, and, and this is one of many. Um, there was a mass exodus of industry to the Far East uh, in the 90s. They, uh, they exported deflation to our countries. However, I always believe that low wages is not a sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, once industry starts moving there, um, you know, the, the standard of living increases. Uh, I was told that China had an inexhaustible supply of labor, but they didn't. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, on the, on the core economics of it, before we get into difficulties getting containers and the cost of getting containers, um, you know, uh, the, the, the actual wage rates in China are accelerating dramatically. Uh, so then you, you, you throw into that the mix of uh, uh, the, the, the supply chain disruption. Um, I was promised in January it was, it was only temporary. At that stage, uh, our contracted rate was for $950 for a 40 foot container from the Far East to Rotterdam. Uh, that went up to nearly 10,000 uh, in January. Um, and, uh, but I was told come Chinese New Year, they'll have the global supply chain sorted out 
uh, we're now being quoted 13,000. So it's not getting any better. Uh, you touched on uh, another very important point on, uh, on sustainability. Like, is it right that we fill containers uh, and, and we, 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 we ship them around the world? Uh, international shipping, you know, they, they use, you know, a, a, the bunker level fuel that they use is the most uh, a highly uh, uh, emissions that's available out there. Only 5% of the shipping fleet has been converted over to LPG, which is, which is a start, but there's an awful lot more we can do. Uh, I'm very fond, uh, I'm very clear that onshoring, um, and when I say onshoring, I just don't mean Ireland, I mean Europe, has enormous potential. Uh, again, we have to take everything into consideration. Uh, like in the Far East, they're still building, building coal power plants. Um, and th this means a lot to Glen Dimplex, it means a lot to me. But more importantly, it means a lot to our customers. Uh, so I think that is an, a, a, an unstoppable force. There's nothing I'm seeing out there. I just think the pandemic has brought it to the fore. Okay, good. Hildegard, can I come over to you? Well, one of the balance between the, the two business speakers today was that Neil is in, in, the, in the goods economy, you're more in the services economy. Um, Death of distance is often talked, has long been talked about. I, I, I'd be interested to get your views on whether the acceleration has made market access easier for Irish. Sorry, companies. Dan, you just froze there for a second. So oh. I got, I'd be interested in and then freeze. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, a bit, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting a, a bad connection here. I, can you hear me now? Is it clear? Yes, yes, fire away. I'd be interested to get your, your views on issues around the death of distance and whether platforms like this uh, during the pandemic, the accelerated uptake of these kind of meetings, of, of non-in-person meetings, may have made market access easier uh, for, for companies. So you know, is that death of distance thing, has that been accelerated and will that make it easier for businesses to consider uh, accessing for the first time uh, or for deeper access to foreign markets. Okay, I, I, for, first on, I'll just build upon what Neil said because I totally agree with him in relation to the supply chain. And I know from our own experience um, delivering services to clients, we can see also that there's a shift in focus and, and I think it's underlined also into European legislation. And I think that's important for and maybe the audience today to, to reinforce that. The, the whole uh, food to fork strategy, the, the green deal, the energy transition, the approach to from a linear to a circular economy means that actually, you know, we will now not export, um, you know, uh, um, and the green fence that happened in China, you know, that means now that we actually will produce and, and produce secondary raw materials in Europe. I think that's a huge opportunity um, for Irish organizations and, and uh, for sure that will only rapidly grow and expand. And you can see that already in terms of consumer behaviors also within the, the food and beverage market. So companies like Danone have you know, over 90% of their, their products now made locally in relation to it. Or um, recently I was speaking to the CEO of Spar International, Tobias Wasmus, and they're building local hubs, local supply chains. You know, they're a global organization of 40 billion, but it's all locally done in relation to it. And even with COVID, you know, um, with closing down barriers and tourism, then they were using, you know, local products from farmers into their, their, their food stores. So that trend will not change. It has been a weak signal, but I think the COVID uh, has actually expedited that in full. That's number one. And I think also that will happen in light of uh, also the rulings uh, this week uh, with Chevron, Exxon, Shell in relation to oil and gas and what that means going forward. The second question then, um, is, was about uh, digital. Um, we know now around 70% of all sales are done online. And yes, of course, there's a huge amount of that done with the Amazons and, and others. But I can also see from um, our business perspective, we have trained up uh, our people. And yes, we're a global organization, but in each country, we can range you know, from a, a small entity to one that's you know, 100 million to, to 2 billion. So um, we all are ultimately a network of people or, and, and experts. So we also are training now our, our, our uh, commercial people, our business development people, who just to build an Anne's point, they're not always 
um, traditional business development people. There may be technical or operational people that have empathy, warmth. Again, uh, the sales funnel is a process. So again, it's it's a practical process. And you just, you know, let's not forget we're human beings connecting with each other. That accounts for a huge amount, you know. You trust, you buy from who you trust. Um, so we're training them to actually be able to connect, pitch, give an elevator pitch by way of, of um, you know, um, uh, forums like this and also like forums like this you don't always have the ability to to build rapport or rigor in the beginning because it's quite structured and it's quite distant so how do you adapt and how do you grow but I think really it's expedited the ability for SMEs and smaller companies to reach into that market people are used now to zoom calls or hangouts or team meets or LinkedIn approaches you know so really it should um, break down barriers to entry and, and allow for uh, Irish companies to expand and, and, and rapidly grow. Okay, thanks. And then just to make, you know, some of the, the panelists here may not want, want to, to say something sort of political, but, uh, you know, as a think tank, I think it's important to say that, you know, relations with China have clearly deteriorated and the business risks of doing business in China have risen and I think that'll be another factor that will uh, shorten supply chains at least uh, in terms of Europe and China and the US and China. Indeed we had a speaker, a high level American speaker uh, a few months back who suggested that the shortening of supply chains between the US and China could actually benefit Ireland, that American companies may find that uh, doing business in a place like Ireland uh, may be a better choice for them than doing business in China. So there could be opportunities there in, in that change of supply chains. Um, a question to you, Neil, from Manus Rooney, uh, one of Anne's colleagues at Enterprise Ireland. Uh, really interesting approach to mar market selection that you set out in your, in your presentation, uh, Neil. Um, he asks, when you enter a new market, how do you get the approach and balance right between being local and taking advantage of the overall synergies across the Eurozone. So is this local element specific to the Eurozone or a similar trend for your global business? Um, it's a similar trend to, the, to, to our global business. There are so much disparities. You, but you, you, it, it's getting that inside knowledge. For instance, I showed you our fuel effect fires. Uh, believe it or not, they look different in every, every market. But we have a common chassis. Uh, for instance, in Australia, their most common wood is a, is, is red gum tree that they it, it grows wild. They cut it down, they chop it up, and they they put it in their fires. If 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 we set down fires made in made in Ireland that have uh, birch or pine uh, as the fuel bed, it just looks wrong to them. They're used to seeing their red gum tree in a fire, uh, and and. And, and taking that localization, that's very easy for us to change the fuel effect. Uh, and it could have an enormous difference to the market. Uh, you know, I could, I could sit there and I could tell them, you know, but yeah, when you, when you burn you know, Irish wood, you know, it gives a beautiful flame effect and all of that, but it's what they're used to. Again, I showed the fan heaters, the two fan heaters. And you asked me just in the previous question, I didn't get to answer it. Uh, they, are, they are identical in functionality in everything that they do, they deliver the same heat. When you buy a fan heater, it's a distress purchase. You're cold, you want a solution. Should you really care if it's a vertical, uh, as we call an upright or a letterbox? Uh, no, it shouldn't. But when you design a product, it could cost you 400,000 euro to design a product from scratch. 300,000 of that is in, is in the engineering. Uh, of the product, whereas only 100,000, a quarter of it is actually in the tooling. So if you're smart, for an extra 20%, you could have two products. Uh, so inside the products, they have the same motor, they have the same thermostat, they have the same cutout. Uh, they have all of the internal wiring is all the same. It's just in a different aesthetic. So it's trying to be smart. And instead of setting out to design one product and then design another, you know, try to take in these global preferences into an early an early stage of the process. Good. Look, we're, as we move towards the end, one of the aspects uh, I'd like to discuss is is uh, exchange rate and, and the euro. Uh, one of the things that certainly as an economist that surprised me after the the adoption of the euro was that there wasn't a bigger shift towards sourcing from the eurozone to take advantage of the elimination of exchange rate risk that Irish 
businesses continued really to import from the UK as the biggest supplier. That looks like it's changed with Brexit uh, and the, the, the shock of Brexit, and there has been a shift towards uh, continental European markets. Anyone have any thoughts on, on the importance of, uh, of exchange rate, exchange rate risk, and, and the, the, the ease of doing business with the euro area? Um, is, is that a factor, perhaps more for you, Neil, than, than, uh, than you, Hildegard? I think that when the transition to the euro happened, uh, we were all fluent in multi-currencies. So it, it wasn't a big shock to continue to do a small little mental calculation to go to, to sterling. However, as new generations are coming through, you know, people have, have grown up with one currency. We grew up with multi-currencies. Um, so I think that that is also, that is also helping the shift. Uh, I think it also uh, was dramatic around the Brexit vote, as we saw enormous volatility in what was stable currencies uh, for a long time. I also have the, the advantage that um, within uh, Glen Dimplex, we have manufacturing in Europe and we share best practice. So we have, we have sources of, of componentry uh, in Europe and we have, a, we have an active uh, purchasing function that compares and contrasts suppliers. I think it's actually interesting to uh, go back to what Anne sort of said, where there was a, there was a, a strong preference for single source supply for a long time. We have benefited enormously from that. Now multinationals, particularly in our, in our precision cooling business, want competitive sourcing. They want dual sources of supply. Uh, so that's opened an opportunity for us. In, uh, although we, we would have a large market share relative in the market of, 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 of uh, uh, about 20% of the global cooling business, 80% of that market is now open for us to, to, to go after. Um, so I do believe that the, 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 that uh, Europe is opening up as a, as, a, as a supply base for Ireland and we need to, we need to accelerate that. Uh, but I think everyone's, pro everyone's focus has been the market opportunity rather than sourcing. Yeah, I would agree. And I think also it's a known risk. So you know that currency, as, as Neil said, I grew up on the border. So punt and, and uh, now I'm showing my age, uh, punt and pound were you know, part of it and the euro transition was, was where it was. So w that risk, once you know what it is and you can identify it, you can mitigate it through hedging or whatever, you know, and, uh, diversification. And even we, we export um, secondary raw material to different uh, uh, clients in many countries. I think the biggest shift or the biggest trigger or, or, or um, game changer now will be really the the kind of the European policy in relation to as I said the ecological transformation um, supply chain moving back um, you know uh, reducing carbon emissions and uh, the food to fork policy you know trying to reduce waste by a third of all the food that we do just imagine the amount of consumption and and wastage in terms of as you said Neil's 13,000 euros you know to transport something across you know so I think that will have much more of a, a game player and I think maybe um, COVID and, and indeed the Brexit actually um, made people um, uh, acutely aware of the risks and maybe uh, from that always with the risk there's always an opportunity and we're very good at taking the opportunities so that has changed uh, the market and maybe opened up um, much more the potential to look at Europe and to expand in Europe because of that. Great, thank you. Look, I'm going to give the final word to Anne as we're in the last two minutes. Uh, we can't get to all the questions. Let me just throw them out because we have two more of these sessions, July, September. Uh, these are a couple of good questions here, which we'll hold over to the next time. Finbar O'Sullivan asks, any views on how the Irish, on how Irish SMEs can benefit from the experience of the Irish diaspora in Europe? Great question. Keep that one for the next time. Sava Green from the Department of Ent Enterprise, Trade and Employment asks, what measures would you recommend the Commission, European Commission and member states take to make the single market as free-flowing uh, uh, and single as possible? For example, are there particular barriers we need to address? So very good question, specific question. We'll hold both of those over for the next event, event in July. Uh, and in the final minute, just hand over to Anne for any closing thoughts uh, as, our co, uh, as our partner on this event uh, to close the event. Anne, over to you. Thank you, Diane, and, and thank you to, to you and, and to our, our, our speakers and our audience. I might just go back to something that um, the Tanishtha said at the beginning. 
he talked about um, the reputation of Irish companies in terms of the level of innovation, the flexibility and the friendly way in, we, in which we do business. And I, I really would like to highlight that. I mean, I'm just blown away by the companies that we work with. It's a real privilege. And like I said earlier, I would I hate to see a lost opportunity. So I'd like to finish, I suppose, with saying, look, we have brilliant companies with brilliant innovation that is recognized across the Eurozone and we're easy to do business with. And I would just love to see us taking real advantage and using what we have to really leverage and the single market and develop um, those opportunities to really build on the Irish industry base and, and to improve and the contribution that Irish enterprise has to the Irish economy so that we have more Glen Dimplexes of this world um, as we move forward. But, but that would be my closing thoughts. Thank you to the audience in particular, but also thank you to Neil and Hildegard um, for all of their contributions and to you, Dan, and the IIEA. And congratulations on your 30th anniversary. Thanks so much, and I very much echo those points, uh, and uh, more Glenn Dimplexes uh, would definitely be the way forward. Um, Hildegard Neil, many thanks for being so generous with your time and your thoughts today. Hope uh, everyone in the audience found it useful. Look forward to the, the next session in a couple of months on this, and wishing everyone a very good and productive day. Good morning. Mm -hmm.